Welcome to the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh's Case Notes podcast. Over the next few months, we're going to work our way around the body head to toe, exploring different body parts and organs and their history in a cultural, medical, social sense. We're going to hear from a historian or curator about their work studying these body parts and their history. And we'll finish up each episode by exploring some of the recipes that were developed in history to treat that part of the body. Welcome to the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh's Head to Toe podcast, where we make our way around the body. My name is Daisy Cunningham, and I am the college's heritage manager and librarian. My name is Olivia Howarth, and I'm a volunteer with the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh Heritage. And we've made it today as far as the legs. One of the things that I found very fascinating when reading up about this is the diseases of the legs that are most commonly referenced, as far as I can tell, in sort of the the 1700s, 1600s, are rheumatism and gout. And they are very clear in a lot of these texts by doctors that the clinical difference between rheumatism and gout is whether the person who has it is rich or not. That's how you diagnose that disease. I do have probably a very bad understanding of gout as being what rich men who drank a lot of port got. Is that the right assumption to be made or is the distinction the other way around? Yes and no, you're not wrong. However, there are a bunch of causes of gout. That is one of them. But another one is lead poisoning. A lot of industrial labourers who were working in particular types of factories or were particular types of material would actually be very prone to gout because it's not just to do with eating rich food. That's part of it, but it's not all of it. So gout, in many ways, is viewed quite differently. But rheumatism is also often viewed quite differently, particularly in the 1700s. They talk a lot about how rheumatism is a disease of working age people. So this is not a disease associated with older people at all. It's particularly associated with people from sort of puberty to around 35 years old. So it's a disease of young people. Is that because if you're working, then you're outside, you're more exposed to the elements? I'm not entirely sure what causes rheumatism here. Part of the problem is neither are they. Um, (laughs) So I think the term rheumatism in the 21st century is obviously not the same as what they're talking about. They're sort of using it as kind of a big bucket term for pains in the body, particularly pains in the limbs, particularly in the legs. And so really, it's basically what, what you've just said, that if you're at that age, you're more likely to be doing physical hard labour, you're more likely to be outside. And so you're more likely to hurt yourself in a whole bunch of different ways. And let's just call all of those different ways rheumatism. Am I right in thinking that one of the things that doctors might have prescribed for rheumatism is horse riding? (laughs) Yes. And as as with so many of these things, though, that's obviously a a social class element to that. If you're a poor labourer, you're probably not going to have horse riding recommended (laughs) to you because the odds of you being able to get your hands on a horse are fairly slim. To be honest, a lot of the treatments are exactly the sort of treatments that they use for so many other things. Peruvian bark, leeches, lots of bloodletting, you know, things like that. There are a lot of patent medicines developed as well. So there's a lot of infallible rheumatism tinctures and things like that. Wearing flannel shirts comes up. I assume that's probably to do with temperature. So what you mentioned before, but what they're particularly fixated on is moving between extremes of temperature. You know, someone will be diagnosed with rheumatism because they drank a very cold beer on a hot day. That's enough to give you rheumatism, according to this understanding of it. I do feel sorry for the people who are suffering from it because doctors can be very patronising towards poor people in this era. And so a lot of the time they'll go, well, this person has recurring rheumatism because they're just not doing what I've told them to do to help them And then you look at what they've told these charitable, poor patients to do, and it's stay in bed for two months to recover. And you go, well, but you need to have a job because you need to eat. So a lot of the treatments are just impossible. Either, as you say, horse riding, if you're poor, is unattainable. Lying in bed for two months is unattainable. They're, They're being blamed for a perpetuation of something that they have no power over. Is clothing something that was an accessible form of treatment then? 
the horror people. One of the problems was the amount of sort of heavy knitted or very thick clothing that retained water. I think that was a problem was Um, people getting wet and then staying wet. And I think probably the most common clothing was that sort of thick, heavy kilt type material. Mm. By the end of the 1700s, there is a lot more of the mass produced clothing accessible. On the subject of clothing, I read this fascinating article by a historian called Karen Harvey that's all about the male leg. She talks about the shift in clothing styles over the 1700s. There was at one point men would dress as extravagantly as women did. You know, mm. you, I'm sure you've seen kind of paintings with the kind of the velvet and the brocade and the incredibly ornate sort of clothing. And she talks about the shift towards the idea that that kind of extravagant display became viewed as inherently feminine. And so men wore increasingly simplified clothing. And she specifically talks about trousers in that context. The more wealthy you were, especially before the kind of real mass production comes in in the in the 1800s, the more simple, clean cut, especially trousers, because trousers were adult male clothing. So in that era, young boys would either wear dresses or they would wear shorts. The transition to trousers were very important. And increasingly, the trousers were very pale and white trousers were very, very typical or very, very pale cream her argument was that it they or you almost look naked. They're like flesh. I could also see an argument that very pale things show wealth because you are very clean and everyone else is wearing dark colours that kind of hide the the dirt, but also that they are very tight, very light coloured trousers that wealthy men would wear that kind of showed their muscles, their masculinity, their strength, their wealth, all that sort of stuff. So like the the meaning of trousers was really fascinating to me. And at some point, I'm going to delve further down that rabbit hole and find out more. (laughs) I found out that Henry VIII, supposedly he injured his foot playing tennis and his foot swelled up and he started wearing a loose black velvet slipper. And so it became fashionable amongst courtiers to do the same, to wear loose black velvet slippers. I feel like we've talked about something similar when we did the hair episode. I think that was Charles II and his wigs. The monarch does anything and everyone just follows suit. Thinking about what we were saying about the importance of the aesthetic of the leg and and what it means for masculinity. I was reading up a bit about amputees and prosthetic legs. And again, this is one of those recurring themes that we've definitely talked about when we talked about eyes in previous episodes and we talked about ears. The Victorian almost obsession with the idea of what is normal in inverted commas or or what is acceptable and what is sort of stigmatised and othered. And amputation, unsurprisingly, falls into that sort of category. There's this idea that using a prosthetic is almost sort of fraudulent. You're almost trying to deceive people or trying to live without being honest. There was a Mexican general who's particularly a controversial figure called General Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana, and he self-styled himself as Napoleon of the West. And (laughs) during something which is like a very cute name, but it wasn't, called the Pastry Wars, in the early 1800s, he organised the defence of Veracruz, against the French. And in the process, his left leg was struck by French cannon fire and later amputated. Four years after the battle, he decided to dig up his amputated leg and rebury it in an elaborate state funeral with full honours. It included cannon salvos and recitations of poems and long speeches and prayers in his honour as a general. And then the amputated leg was put inside a crystal vase and buried under the Santa Paula Cemetery Monument. I think he was using it as publicity for his return to power because he became Mexico's president. And then (laughs) he was reportedly holding his prosthetic leg during parades and waving it in the air to remind people of what he'd sacrificed defending his country. But then later, during the Mexican-American Wars, he was in the Battle of Cerro Gordo and he had to escape pretty quickly without his artificial leg. And then the prosthetic was basically taken as spoils of war and it remains on display at Illinois State military museum and although he's he's a very controversial figure there are campaigners in mexico that are trying to get the prosthetic leg returned to mexico and repatriated 
I was going to ask you why, but it does make sense when, that there's an actual reason why it was sort of a promotional tool. I mean, how did he know where it was buried in the first place? Yes, it might just be a leg, mightn't it? Mm. I mean, not necessarily his leg. When I was looking into it, there was a lot of stuff about battlefield amputations in particular. And I found a lot of like American Civil War photography of potentially amputations being done, although I'm not sure if they were staged photographs, but also men wearing prosthesis in Victorian portraiture. I think as with so many Victorian things, there's layers to it as well. There's a huge difference between someone who was born a particular way or even becomes that way in childhood versus somebody who is a kind of older man. There's also a huge gender element to it. With a man, it can be heroic. With a woman, it it cannot be heroic. The context is very key. Um, But also, I was reading about phantom limb syndrome or the idea of phantom limbs which apparently first came into being or at least first got the name in 1871 it was in a work of fiction by a a clinician and his name was Silar Mitchell and the argument that I read was that it's significant because you know this then permeates into popular culture it gets used in fiction and non-fiction and then obviously later makes it into films and things is the idea that loss of a limb not only physically affects you but has can have this very extreme psychological effect as well so it's even more stigma not only are you unable to do certain jobs or do certain things but also there's something wrong with you in a psychological sense as well so bringing a whole other extra level of stigma to it i think it's significant that this person you know the person who wrote this book is a fiction writer and a neurologist because it is then bleeding into how you're treating people in the real world Mm. In the UK, you just say, oh, I've got a leg cramp. Normally your calf muscle. But in America, it's called a Charlie horse cramp. There's different theories, all related to baseball. So one idea is that it was baseball players that coined the term after a lame horse called Charlie, who pulled the roller at Chicago White Sox ballpark. And then another one, which I think is the more commonly understood origin, is that it's attributed to a baseball pitcher from the 1880s called Charlie Radborn, who also was known as Old Hoss, and he suffered leg cramps during baseball games. Somehow I've managed to live my life and never hear the phrase Charlie. Charlie Hoss. I, I feel I feel more educated now <laughs> than I was five minutes ago. Thank you. The other bit that I've got is about Philip II of Macedonia. So he was the the father of Alexander the Great, and there are lots of ancient texts that describe how he suffered this leg wound. He was returning from battle and was attacked by Thracians, presumably because he had refused to share the spoils of war. And a cavalryman put a spear through his leg whilst he was on a horse, basically impaled him through the thigh, killed the horse and then crippled Philip. The interesting thing in this article was that they'd found remains in the royal tomb in Virginia in Greece. And they were able to recreate the injury of Philip II and verify that these remains were his through 3D imaging and radiography of the remains, but also recreating the wound on the cadaver. They would have rushed him to see a physician, removed the lance really quickly because they were afraid of infection, and then wrap it in dressings that had been soaked in wine or rose oil and then they would have bandaged it really tightly and then the remains showed that the knee had fused in position and it had fused in a position that was suitable for riding. Do you think they would have weighed up would it be more useful to be fused straight or fused in a way that would allow for riding and they'd chosen that or is that just the luck of the draw? I'm not sure but I assume they would have bandaged it in order that he could ride home yes and then and then it just fused that way for our case study today we're going to look at leg ulcers and specifically the leg ulcers of king henry the eighth retrospective diagnosis is the process where people look at figures from history and try to figure out what they suffered from It is pretty contentious and very difficult to be definitive for lots of reasons. The lack of records, changing definitions of diseases over time, 
and the changing nature and symptoms of diseases. A lot of different diagnoses have been retrospectively applied to Henry VIII, including syphilis, diabetes, and malaria, but none of these definitively. But there is definitely enough evidence to show that the king suffered from very severe leg ulcers. It is thought that Henry's wounds resulted from an accident which took place during a jousting tournament in 1536, when he was thrown from his horse and kicked unconscious. Only one year later, a letter to Viscount Lizzle from his business agent John Hussey said that, quote, The king goes seldom abroad because his leg is something sore. And one year after that, in 1538, the French ambassador wrote in a dispatch that, quote, the king has had stopped one of the fistulas of his legs, and for ten or twelve days the humours which had no outlet were like to have stifled him. This comment refers to the fact that usually the ulcers which Henry developed on his legs were intentionally prevented from healing by lancing them regularly. The prevailing medical principle at the time, humoral theory, argued that to keep the body in balance, any bad humours or fluids needed to be removed. To keep the ulcers open would allow the badness to escape, so the ulcers remaining constantly weeping was by design. But this meant constant pain and constant infections, and many around the king commented on the rotting smell emanating from his legs. In 1541, another communication from a French ambassador noted that, quote, One of his legs, formerly opened and kept open to maintain his health, suddenly closed to his great alarm. For, five or six years ago, in a like case, he thought to have died. A handwritten recipe book, compiled in the 1540s for the king himself, is held in the British Library. It contains many recipes for sores, swollen legs and ulcers. The ingredients used are fairly typical for recipes of the well-off at this time, including pearls, wine and unicorn horn. Other ingredients include apples, eggs, rose water and chamomile. One recipe recommended for swollen legs, applying warmed sponges to the leg morning and evening. The audio clip you're about to hear is from the Welcome Collection. It's a mini biography of an amputee and is part of a short film which was made in 1969, which was donated to the Welcome by Queen Mary Hospital, London. And just as a heads up, because it's part of a film, there is background noise throughout. So beginning with the man making breakfast, including the sound of a boiling stovetop kettle, and then the sounds of passers-by outdoors. The full film can be viewed on the Welcome Collections website. When I came from Ireland just after the First World War, I had a wooden leg, but it was no good, no good at all. Then they sent me to Roehampton. My wife died 12, 13 years back. We had two daughters, both married now, only my son Michael's still with me. He's a postman. When they were kids, they were always getting into trouble, but the porter, a nice man, used to keep an eye on them for me. I make the breakfast every morning. Eggs and bacon he likes. I clean up, do the washing, scrub the floors, look after the place. Oh, he's a very good lad, but he could never clean up. He could never make his bed. Throws everything around the place. I tidy my own room, and then off I am to work. Back home in Ireland, I was always in hospital when I should have been in school. And every time I came back to school, the teacher just used to push me up with all the kids of my own age. Well, I missed too much to be able to keep up. So I quit school when I was about 13 or 14, and I started to learn tailoring. I was 12 years old when the accident happened. They took me to the Matter Hospital, Dublin, and then to Wexford Hospital. I had 14 operations in all, but still the leg had to come off. The leg had to come off, finished. I was very active on the crutches in Ireland, I used to keep a greyhound and a terrier and go after rabbits with a mate of mine. Whenever we'd come to a ditch or a gate, 
I just swing on the crutches and vault over. My mate had to climb. I learned tailoring, but I could never cut cloth. I only mark it up for the cutters. In the evenings, I watch the telly, or I listen to music. I like Irish music, or I go to the parks. There are some very nice parks around here, and I enjoy walking. Welcome to Recipes of Yore. We're going to explore some unusual medical recipes from the past. The way in which the word recipes was used in the past is a bit different from how it's used today. So it could mean recipes for cooking, for medicine, or even recipes for cleaning products or cosmetics. Very few of them were treatments we would recognise in the 21st century, and certainly none of these should be tried at home. Leg complaints, because they were more often chronic than acute, more often complaints you lived with rather than died from, were particularly likely to be treated at home by members of the family or by friends or neighbours. Some ingredients would be sourced from apothecaries or other merchants, but many were common cooking ingredients found within the home. There were a fairly large number of leg-related complaints you could suffer from, and an even longer list of remedies for them. Recipe books contain treatments for leg ulcers, sore knees, sprains, swellings, varicose veins, scabby legs, rheumatism, gangrene, rickets, and, the rather unpleasant sounding, legs that do rankle and fester. One recipe for rheumatism, taken from a book in our collections titled Taylor's Ready Doctor, recommended, quote, the powder of a bull's pizzle, drunk every day about 12 o'clock, in the water of tar. Another recipe from the same text, this time for rickets, stated, quote, Make a poultice of black snails, cover the child's whole body, and give him or her water to drink that proceeds from an iron mine. Also, put rusty iron among water, and make the child's gruel thereof. Do this twice per week for three weeks, and you may depend upon a noble cure. Treatments for gout were very varied. That same book, The Ready Doctor, recommended, quote, Take of petroleum in a draught of cold water, otherwise the juice of the churchyard nettles, with rum used in like manner. To three pints of the juice, add one pint of rum. Another treatment for gout, this time from a book from our collections dated 1731, called The Poor Man's Physician, combined some pretty common domestic ingredients with some rarer imported ones. Quote, Take frankincense, and saffron, the weight of an egg. A little strong vinegar, take of goat's milk or of cow's milk, the yolk of two eggs, of oil of roses, and crumbs of bread. You can imagine how expensive ingredients such as saffron would have been in the early 1700s. Their inclusion may reflect the fact that gout was still seen as a disease of the wealthy. For those who couldn't afford to purchase the ingredients needed for these recipes themselves, for some, at least, these could be accessed via their employer or their local church minister or members of the landed gentry. Although many of these options began to disappear in the 1700s with increased industrialization and emigration to the cities, still many domestic servants could rely on their masters or rural farm workers on their laird or minister to provide access to ingredients usually restricted to the wealthier elites. Thank you for listening to this Case Notes podcast. If you'd like to find out more about the work we do, you can visit our website at rcpe.ac.uk forward slash heritage. You can also find us on Twitter at RCPE Heritage, and we have a Just Giving page, RCPE Heritage, linked to on our website if you'd like to support our work and help to fund future podcasts. Thank you. <laughs>